So um, thanks a lot for inviting me to, to give this, uh, well, let's say a brief lecture about Indian agriculture, its problems, and to focus on the constructive policy solutions that are available today. Some that are available, some that will be made available soon, right? So I'll focus on the latter part of it, um, but to just introduce the problem, I just want to say where are we in Indian agriculture, right? That's something that we start with. And the two key messages that I have is, one, that there are several alternatives available, not just in terms of the practice of agriculture, but also in our substantive understanding, what I mean is the material and energy realities of agriculture, that is, alternatives in the substantive understanding of agriculture, and also alternatives are available in our knowledge policy practice relationships. Yeah? So these are, this is one major message. The other thing that I want to emphasize is that there are some state governments in this country some well with strong backing and support with civil society organizations from from local governments that are already practicing some of these that is there is evidence available in india today of state governments doing well knowledge policy alternatives in agriculture right and what are they we'll talk, talk about those in the latter part um, in particular about the, uh, the comprehensive revival of millets program in Andhra and the Orissa millet mission in Orissa, right? Um, there is also a big experiment on, um, on zero budget natural farming as, as we know it now, which is community-based sustainable agriculture in Andhra going on right now. But we won't dwell too much on that because that's still taking place and there's a lot of thinking, rethinking, revising guidelines and so on that's happening within the Andhra government. But we we'll talk about these two experiments, the CRMP, the Comprehensive Revival of Millets Program, and the Orissa Millets Mission as two, well, let's say, substantive economics in agriculture that has changed. Yeah? What, is, what has changed is, is our emphasis. Now, um, when we say that these are two examples, or let's say the second message, that there are alternatives that are happening, these are alternatives that already are, well, let's say, beginning to show impacts on farms, on farm incomes, on the environment and most importantly on food and nutrition and the last most importantly because right from the 1990s 1998 onwards we've seen ICR reports so the Indian Council of Agricultural Research the apex body of agricultural science of this country declaring that well you know wheat and rice produced in India today especially in our green revolution belt is deficient in nine major minerals and micronutrients. So what does it mean? We're basically eating wheat, well, starch and water, right? So there are ways to change this to more nutritious and again, not just nutritious for us, for the environment and for the farming community too, right? So very, very briefly to summarize the problems that we face in this country in terms of agricultural problems, uh, well, farmers protest right outside their own national capital. I mean, we've been witnessing that for almost a year now, yeah? And well, as a middle class, we've also been largely indifferent to it. But why is that indifference allowed? And also, why is, why is it that we are allowed to just take these problems as farmers' problems? It's not really our problems. I think it's, it's high time that we acknowledge that these farmers' problems exist because of us, because of a certain development pattern that we've chosen, and because we've slaughtered agriculture into that development pattern, right? for us, for a certain privileged middle class in this country, which is about, well, let's say 12 to 15 percent of this country now. But how did this, how does this happen and how did we buy into this? Yeah, that's a bigger story, which comes from the history of development economics. Again, we won't get into that. But again, Nobel Prize winning economists have spoken about this, right? I mean, human beings, workers, farmers converted to human capital, nature, land and water and soil converted to natural capital. All these are, are the legacies that we get from the 1950s and 60s development economics. We won't get into that. But in terms of the substantive problems that we face today, we've also faced not just the farmers face sitting outside their own capital and protesting. We've seen, well, decades of farmer suicides, right? I mean, lacks of them dying um, of their own volition because their chosen profession is no longer viable. It's not keeping them alive now, right? Not allowing them to bring, bring up a living, right? Maintain their families, educate their children, take care of their health care. Nothing is, is viable with their, with their farming. Who pushed them into this? It's, well, we as a middle class, we have a big, big, big role in this. 
because we chose to, to well, let's say, go with certain policies of our own governments. Here again, I'm not talking about a Congress government or BJP government or anything of that sort. Yeah? I'm just talking about the ways in which our nation state has made decisions for a particular sector of the economy, which is not really a sector, but a way of life, a part of our own existence as a nation state or as a global community, right? Choices, for instance, problems. Choices of crops, crop livestock systems, well, shifting 16 to 18 crops per hectare, you know, in Punjab, for instance, farmers will tell you that, to just monocrops. Choices of, well, chemical fertilizers, massive. I mean, I won't even get into the numbers of lakhs, crores that is given as fertilizer subsidy. Is subsidy the answer or should there be public investments? Yeah. Should there be public investments where farmers are capital formation in agriculture? So the problems take different, well, let's say, are multidimensional so to say yeah and also have multiple answers again depending on the kind of scale that we're talking about if it is a local farming community if it's a local government or a district government the answers are different and the ability to make these policies at the block level were also discussed in this country once upon a time right 19, late 1970s you will recall I and mean, there was a lot of discussion about block level planning right? but that was given up that was given up and instead the chosen path of centralization and consolidation of everything related to agriculture was what was adopted. Now, let's again, not emphasize too much on these problems, but talk about what are the solutions that are available today. The question of how we got there, like I said, is the legacy of development economics. But we also chose to encourage a particular kind of, well, let's say supply syndrome of the state, right? The state decided to supply everything from the Green Revolution, well, let's say the major uh, inputs like irrigation, yeah, um, what chemicals, yeah, um, the seeds, everything, right? And as the supply syndrome becomes stronger, there is a certain section of the middle class the certain section of the, of the, well, let's say, the receivers of the benefits of the subsidy, all in the name of the poor farmer, yeah? the gains from the subsidy go to a certain section of the population and not really to the farming community. Here again, the legacy of development economics plays a major role. Right? Now, why are we talking about this? Because here again, the answer to, well, let's say, the Punjab farmers and their protests, in terms of markets, right? Markets as let's say, or the idea of marketing surpluses, well, has now, we've all bought into this now of, you know, long value chains of processed foods available on supermarket shelves, not short value chains or value networks of locally produced and processed nourishing food, yeah? Healthy ecosystems and healthy people, jobs, decent work that comes with that processing and marketing, right? We don't talk about that. We don't talk about a substantive, a material relationship between agriculture and the non-farm sector. In our villages, in our local, well, let's say, peri-urban and urban areas, yeah? we don't talk about that anymore. There are experiments that reveal these answers. Uh, the question of energy, again, one of the most wicked problems that the world has faced, the water energy nexus um, in agriculture. Yeah? Um, why are we talking about irrigation as as the solution yeah when did irrigation become the answer to agricultural production and productivity because all along right from the time when we settled down as you know from hunter gatherers to 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 well let's say settled farming um, communities we chose riverbeds because or, or river river basins because they were they were moist that there was soil moisture available yeah the supply of water as a precondition to agriculture is actually a post well let's say early 20th century, mid 20th century answer. And it becomes the answer for, of course, the Green Revolution, right? And again, let's remember that the Green Revolution, though it's now identified with the high yielding variety seed and all the revolutionary jump and all that in yields, the Green Revolution actually starts with irrigation and chemicals, or in other words, with chemicals and irrigation so that the crop wouldn't die because of the application of chemicals. The chemicals are a legacy of the World War, Second World War surpluses that were available in the developed world which had to be taken somewhere, right? The technology to develop this was available. You had to take these chemicals somewhere. Of course, the Fritz process and, uh, and, and the production of nitrogen and so on. Um, well, even in the pre-independence period, one of the focuses of the, of the well, 1930s was the fertilizer com committee, right? To, to, to invest in fertilizer, because by the 1930s, fertilizer production had become the norm that pe people could actually produce, as Einstein says, pull nitrogen out of thin air, right? We could do that. So we had to invest in those. Now, 
what, what are we saying here? That the legacy of development economics that we spoke about a little while ago is something that is built on, that is, it's an ex post theorization of what was successful in the West, in the developed countries. Yeah? So that is, they could produce this, that they could do this, and they, for them, industrial growth was leading up to economic growth and development. And therefore, the rest of the world also had to follow catch up theories. That's what we should do. Yeah? That we should catch up with the West, invest in agriculture so that agriculture will lead to development through industrialization. So industrial agriculture therefore becomes a norm for all these newly, newly independent developing countries. Yeah? Classified as developing, a subjective identity given to us already. Yeah? The answers to these today that come from our state governments, yeah? where our state governments are now, and some of them are investing differently, are thinking differently, are drawing up new guidelines. Yeah? What are these answers? Um, well, let's, let's very briefly, I mean, I, I just speak about two major successes here. Yeah? Uh, one is the, the Andhra, like I said, the Andhra uh, Comprehensive Revival of Millets Programme. The other is the Orissa Millets Programme. Um, like I said, if you look at them now, I mean, Union Government, Niti Aayog last year, 2020, and of course recently also celebrated the Orissa Millet mission and its success. Yeah? They want to formulate a national millets policy. Um, that may not be the right answer. Yeah, we have to think about it. What is a policy? A policy has several components, right? The major component is the goal. What do we want? Why do we want a national millets policy? Because maybe rice and wheat is not nutritious now. Yeah? But should we all then consume millets? We've always been a subcontinent that's consumed a diversity of staples, right? Right from the staples like jackfruit, raw jackfruit, tapioca, which is consumed as a staple diet, along with, let's say, fish or beef or any of these, well, additives that go with it. I mean, there was, there was a, a food culture, there was a diverse food culture that exist, existed in the subcontinent, which is gradually wiped out by the rice and wheat revolution, right? Rice and wheat, the focus of everything, ranging from the price support policies of the state to public distribution systems, to input supplies, to technologies generate for these, yeah, for these, for these two commodities, rice and wheat. There's a whole, well, let's say revamping, like I said, a centralization and consolidation of the agricultural science and policy well, segments of our polity, right? Of our, of our governance mechanisms. So there is one goal and there is a set of policy instruments chosen. So there's a policy goal of food, food security, a set of policy instruments that are chosen for these, and a set of implementation practices. As Arun Ghosh writes in the late 1980s, yeah, when actually India had a choice to turn towards decentralized, localized systems of production and consumption, or to turn towards globalized, liberalized production of production and consumption. He chose the latter, of course. Uh, but he says that centralization and consolidation has actually suffocated four of the most leading sectors in this country, agriculture, rural development, health and education. We are still there. Punjab farmers are still crying to the Union government. Why can't the Punjab government do what Orissa government is doing? Yeah? Why doesn't the answer come there? Because of this massive set of subsidies that sustain that system, right? Orissa, thankfully, is not that dependent on, on subsidies as Punjab is. How can we convert these into public investments is the question we should ask today. And there lies our answer. The answer for, well, let's say, Orissa Millet Mission, that, that the Orissa Millet Mission, the Comprehensive Revival of Millet programs, shows us is not just about policies and policy instruments, a policy goal and a set of policy instruments, but it's also about a revival of localized, that is local economies and local food cultures. It draws upon a set of, well, civil society experiences and also a shared pain that comes from being in rainfed agriculture, of living with and learning from the variabilities of rainfed agriculture. Rainfed agriculture, well, has been marked as the poor cousin, the poor well, you know, 60% of arable land in India is rainfed anyway, you know, forget it, 40% is what we should focus on. But rainfed agriculture produces a massive amount of and diversity of commodities. Almost all our livestock. Yeah, I mean, there's such a diversity of, of, rain, of rainfed agriculture systems in this country. It's a gold mine that will help us survive and prosper given climate change, given the kind of nutrition crisis that we're going through now. How do we get there? What are, what are the answers? The answers that Orissa Millet Mission show us today, 
with, well, a whole range of local technology choices. And when, when I say local, it is specifically the block level that we're talking about, the experiment that failed in the late 1970s, right? The block level experimentation choice of local technologies given to communities through what they call lead facilitation agencies, that is lead technical agencies. There are leading NGOs, you take it MSSRF, uh, Pradhan, I mean, Vasan, there are leading well, civil society organizations working with the Orissa government to, to enable this. To identify, well, the local technologies that will actually feed into the local ecosystem and local work, yeah, employment, that will come with the local technologies. Recall Amulya Reddy, right, 1970s, talking about how will India move out of this, what we call capital using technologies, yeah, and labor saving, to more labor using and capital saving. Let's invest, you know, not, not too much of capital and not too much money in infrastructure, but let's create what Amulya Reddy didn't say was what Georges Kirojan had said almost at the same time. Yeah? Again, let's remember Georges Kirojan is somebody who came to India, saw India's work, learned from India, um, and speaks about, well, the energy and economic myth. That is, it's not just a question of, well, a circular flow of money, but a, well, the ways in which matter and energy are used at a particular pace, again, keeping in mind the quantity and quality transformations that the system goes through, but also keeping in mind that there is, that we have to minimize the loss of matter and energy in the system. Now, I'm not saying that the Orissa government has planned block level planning according to what George Kurojan said. That's not what we're saying. But what we're saying is that the theoretical and empirical, well, demands for these came much earlier, the 1970s, with the oil crisis, yeah? We never took those seriously because we were comfortable with fossil fuels. Now, with, with demands to leave fossil fuels underground and uh, all these, we need to think about um, what the alternatives are in terms of theory, policy choices, implementation mechanisms, all leading up to, well, a particular metabolism of the local economy, which will sustain, well, decent work, like I said, employment, a decent income for farm and non-farm actors, and extremely good, that is low entropy, a minimal lo loss of matter and energy in both farm and non-farm sectors. Yeah? Now, this is something that the Orissa government has shown with its Orissa Millet mission. A lot of work needs to be done on that. What we also see with the, with the Comprehensive Revival of Minutes program is, like I said, the legacy of, of civil society organizations. Let me just very briefly talk about what, is, what does this food culture thing mean? You know, it's not just, a, just about gung-ho nationalism or national food or something like that, not that. But a local food culture is also related to the local inequality that people see. Yeah? The, the Deccan Development Society, one of the pioneers in leading this millet-based state nutrition programs, which is the Orisa Millet program in, in Orisa. Deccan Development Society speaks about millets um, through what they call MINI, that is a women's networks of millet-based learning together. Not just about millet production, but about millet processing, consumption, its nutrients, other crops that go along with it, women who make videos, women who talk to each other, women who also save seeds and encourage people to cultivate these seeds, buy them. They, lo they hold local biodiversity festivals. Big events in the subcontinent. Yeah? Um, well, not really reported by our media, but these are big things. One of the things that really strikes me as, as crucial in this local food cultures yeah, as the basis of the science and technology that changes in millet production is the naming of millets as Dalit crops. Yeah? Um, P.V. Satish, who heads um, Deccan Development Society, calls them Dalit crops, not just as, as, well, you know, well, as the mainstream would see it as something that is denigrated, but as to be something that, that we should be proud of, that we should be happy about, that here are certain crops that have thrived and done well despite the legacy of, well, pushing them down through, well, theorized and, well, empirically researched development economics of agricultural development, despite the state's policies being about supplying other things, like, that are not suitable for millet production, that want millets to be replaced by rice and wheat, which did happen in a big way in these two states, in Andhra and in Orissa. But the revival of millets program, building on local food cultures, brings back these crops as robust, resilient, and also highly nutritious locally adapted, 
proud of and owning local food cultures through a system of engaging with local ecosystems. So when we talk about the, well, let's say, the precarity and risk of rainfall agriculture, like I said, it brought together a lot of people. I mean, you have journalists I mean, writing academic works on, on everyone drought, loves a drought, right? I mean, that is everybody gains from a drought. Everybody as in people like us, right? It's not the farmers. So we've had people from, well, let's say, different walks of life engaging with this precarity and risk of rainfall agriculture. But the real answers to it, that is a substantive problems and the identification of some solutions to it happen in the 1980s, 90s, when people start talking about it, when people start, well, civil society organizations and their engagement. I'm talking in particular about a large group of civil society organizations working on rain for agriculture get together um, in a Ford Foundation he was funded program called the Revitalization of Rain for Agriculture Network, yeah, the RRA network. And they articulate this as a problem that has to do with uh, one, multiple dimensions. It's not just a question of production technology. It's not a question of getting them more, more subsidies. Yeah? It's not a question of giving them, well, let's say an income, a guaranteed income or something. It's a question of multiple dimensions. Yeah? And how do we address that? Now that has to be addressed through the state governments. It's not just a civil society organization or a bunch of civil society actors who can do this alone. Now the dialogue for that again starts in, well, the early 2000s. 2013-14, the Central Research Institute of Dryland Agriculture, again, a pioneering research institute in the dryland agriculture domain, talks about, well, not just rain for agriculture, irrigated agriculture, two distinct domains, but about agriculture itself as a sector that is getting more and more vulnerable, open to climate change, I mean, like, like left open, defenseless. Yeah? What are the capacities that are needed? They say, well, it's local capacities. Yeah? The government launches a program called NICRA, which is about well, climate adaptation, research for climate adaptation at the local level, at the district and block level. How do you do that? Several, well, let's say, actors converge around this problem of rate for agriculture and again of agriculture in general. Well, around the, well, the 2010s, 2010, 12, 13, I mean, there are these debates that are happening. By 2016, the, um, well, both the, the comprehensive revival of millet programs in, in Andhra and the Orissa millet mission before formulation, of course, 2016, 15, 16, you see several dialogues, several consultations between civil society organizations and local governments and the state government organizations, with some particip participation from the agricultural sciences also, right? What are these consultations? They talk about, well, the state governments need, need to draw up if they are committed to, well, resolving this agrarian distress question, and also revive millets. Millets have agency. Millets are not like rice and wheat. You can't just stand up and say, pay obeisance to a McDonald burger 50 years older than you because the wheat was harvested 50 years before you were born. But you, you have to, well, see millets as they are. They are, well, short shelf life crops. You can't just powder them and leave it on a shelf and sell it, you know, five years later. You, you have to consume it within the next, well, two months latest. Yeah, They are very rich in their nutrient content and also <coughs> they they well, their local processing and usage is also very diverse. So all these diversities, multiple angles, multiple dimensions of this, of this problem, agriculture, food, nutrition, the environment, pollution, water, a big problem, groundwater exploitation, right? All these converge in, this, in these consultations. What emerges is the identification of well, what later becomes four verticals in the program, in these, when these two state government programs, or policy changes, as we want to call it now, uh, which is basically about four components, that the state needs to revise its guidelines and approach to helping these four components. One is production, of course, local producers of millets in their all the diversity that they want to produce it in, that they are used to producing it in. We are not going to tell them about, you know, well, you can produce a monocrop of ragi, you can't produce anything else. If they want to produce ragi with pearl millet, go ahead. If they want to produce ragi with, well, arhar, that is pigeon pea, go ahead, do it. What is your system used to? What is the best balance of, let's say, pulse and, and millets that you want to do? Go ahead and do it. Crop livestock systems. But identify the components of production that you can do and do it with, well, a local knowledge system that can contribute to it. Yeah? So that we can arrange, so the state can arrange other components that can work with the system. The production system, this one work component. The second was processing component. 
we're not going to buy these in bulk and send it to well rice mills or you know processing but local processing ensuring that women in the local areas especially get processing facilities that they can again you can't do bulk processing of millets like you do for rice because millets are a set of diverse crops you can't do the same well let's say hulling process for for well, these kinds of small grained you know foxtail millet or barnyard millet or or ragi you have to have a different kind of processing system how do you do that what are the kind of machines strangely they discovered that well you know our all our agricultural engineering efforts thus far haven't really produced machines to process millets yeah so they work on these they invest in these the, di the dialogue with well the central food technology research institute the central institute of agricultural engineering they all come on board to talk about this to help them well, build the right kind of small machines that can work with women. It's not that, again, we're not talking about, well, a Luddite transformation or anything, right? I mean, we're talking about where women can work with these equipments, work on processing for what? For local value networks, not the long value chains, right? There is a thinking about this already. The third, so, so that is production, processing, marketing and consumption are the other two components. We'll get to that in a bit. But since we're talking about agriculture in particular, let's just talk about these two, that is the production and processing. But marketing is important because we're not just selling, let's say, bulk commodities like a huge money, yeah? But we're talking about local marketing and again, local, that is sale and purchase of, of commodities. How can, let's say, the public distribution system buy these locally, not wait for it to come through a central public distribution system and supply it back to them, but what is the arrangement that is rearrangement, reorganization and institutional arrangements, including pricing mechanisms, quality standards that need to be put in place for local systems of production, that is processing and marketing. What are, what are the institutions? These were resolved. These were decided at the local level through state level consultations. It didn't come easy. Yeah, a lot of it was built on, well, what we call well, free supply of knowledge and inputs coming from, well, civil society, academics, people who are interested in this, people who are committed to nutrition, you know, um, like I mentioned, um, Satish in De Deccan Development Society, this lady called uh, Salomi Yeshudas, one of the, I mean, brilliant exponents of nutritious recipes with local foods, not just millets, collected foods, forest foods, wild grass, you know, we, we eat a diversity of these consumption systems that are, that exist around us. We've not always just eaten cabbages and cauliflowers, right? We've eaten all of this and that's how we've, we've formed our local diets. So there are experts like this who contributed to these. Again, these may not be experts who have a doctorate or something, but they are experienced and well qualified experts. Here again, I refuse to do, draw a distinction between all not me, but the Orissa Millets, Millets Mission and the, um, the Comprehensive Revival of Millet Program, they refuse to draw a line between these, you know, qualifications of experts and experienced people and so on. They say whoever is, well, a substantive knowledge in reforming these systems comes handy. They are the people we need and we will encourage them to contribute to this. That makes a big difference to the participation of local knowledge, not as participation in my agenda that I'm taking to them, but in their agenda, that is in the local farmer's agenda. In Pan district, for instance, in Raigada, there are documented, documented evidence of about six or seven different types of consumption of the same millet. We're talking about ragi or foxtail millet, right? Why are these different? Depending on the edific factors, depending on the kind of, well, let's say sunlight that you get in different parts of the hills. Yeah. How do you process it? How do you dry it? How does, well, let's say the husk get used? Why are these local systems important? Because we know that there will be a set of changes that will happen now with climate change and also in the past how these systems have been erased. This is a right time, this is the right opportunity and Orisa Millet to revive these and these, these two programs as, well, one as a sponsored program within the state, the CRMP in Andhra, but the other as a mission that's launched by the state government and supported by the state government. Both, well, they reimagine policy guidelines. They put together policy guidelines with, with but not just the state government and its line departments getting a new role, but civil society organizations. For instance, civil society organizations play a role, WASAN, the Watershed Services and Support Network. They become the, the program secretariat for the Orissa Millet Mission, right? Now, how does it happen? That is, they would work with, well, one, 
implementation, not just as implement tail and implementers, facilitation agencies, but as contributing to the program guidelines themselves. Also conducting research with the government so that the government, the state is a learning entity. We don't see the state like that anymore. Yeah? We see, see the union government and its supply syndrome. We don't see this, that the sub-national policy makers who are emerging are learning entities and they learn with and from the local populations. It's a complete transformation of the knowledge policy engagement that we've seen ever since the 1963, well, you know, Ralph Cummings recommended, um, well, you know, centralized line of authority and control, 1963, which the ICR, of course, implements fully, you know, wholeheartedly. That centralized line of authority and control, which, which is needed for the implementation of irrigation, chemical intensive production of, of wheat at that point, rice comes in later, fine. This is a complete transformation with subnational policy actors that is happening today, right? How do we learn from that? The second role that the, that the civil society organizations play, again, not just out of the blue, but with consultation with these, the government and the local populations, is, well, work as facilitation agencies. I mentioned very briefly what this was, right? But a facilitation agency is not just, well, let's say, um, anybody who can who can just walk in there and become a facilitation agency, like I have a bag of fertilizers or I'm selling a, a bag of, um, well, anything ranging from toothpaste to jewels to, I mean, you, you know, all these little f f well, selling units, the same way that, that they operate with agricultural technology or any commodity. Yeah, It could be, well, toothpaste, anything that you sell, right? The engagement of the facilitation agency with the local population, you have to prove it to the state government. You have to say that I have worked in these blocks, in these districts, that our organization has experience with, that this is our knowledge base of, the, of this particular block. The state government has to accept it. And that is not done as one little project document that, are, that, is, that has been supplied. We've seen, you know, well, district, district level planning documents where the first page has been removed and the inner content is all the same, including the names of the districts, right? So we've seen several experiments like this that have not worked. But in this case, you have to prove to the government, you have to make a presentation to the government saying, not just the government, the government, other civil society organizations who are also your, well, maybe local contributors, local collaborators, local competitors, but they will all listen to your, to your expertise, your knowledge of your engagement with, most importantly, your democratic engagement with the local population, right? Now that, this, that is, you get your facilitation agency, well, approval from the government, but the third tier that or the third crucial part of this is how you take that that is how as in the ways of working the institutionalization of this facilitation agency the guidelines for that for civil society organizations and local governments specifically says that it's not just that you go out there and you implement something for the government no you will engage with other community based organizations for instance if there is let's say a community women's organization that is that is um, involved in in producing let's say ragi laddus right let's assume or there is a farmers organization that is involved in breeding local cattle yeah it could be the turpu cattle in, in tamil nadu or you know gujarat cattle i mean concrete or 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 the bunny buffalo whatever I mean, you could have a local local breed in, in orissa it could be any of these community based organizations but you have to bring them on board you have to dialogue with them get them to understand that what we're doing now is only going to strengthen our hands we're not eating into your territory because again let's face it community based organizations can also be very parochial and very narrow minded and very difficult to handle but these lead Fell by what they call lead facilitation, facilitation agencies and not just agencies who are just going out there to implement a set of technologies. They are there to learn from and with the local populations and the key strength that they have there is actually, well, the ability to work with these organizations, farmer producer organizations, another new thing that has come up. Yeah? So many of them have actually enabled the establishment of FPOs, but not just as FPOs as do, do anything and everything, but FPOs that engage with millets, right? So what they institutionalize in the process is feedback loops. Feedback loops where farmers, civil society organizations, and the state in, well, are part of regular consultations. It's not just an annual report. The way of reporting institutionalization and learning is extremely different, almost totally opposed to what we have in the line departments today, right? Now, these guidelines that come up 
are guidelines or the principles of these guidelines, not the exact format. Yeah, you probably don't need one tier in, in let's say, in Shimla or in the hills, where there is well probably a different structure. Yeah, of the lie of the land, water, whatever. Yeah, so you probably have a local cultural actor like the like the local devta in Himachal, yeah, who probably won't won't be very different from the local NGO in in the institutionalization capacities. But what you can do is to institutionalize these principles, these lessons learned in other states. Why aren't we doing it? Yeah, there is a major concern today that this especially in Orissa, with the Orissa Millet Mission. We, I have declared it a success today. Yes, it is a success. The, the, the Union government is saying that we should have a national millets policy, we should do the same thing, distribute linkages with local state, state nutrition program, that is the Anganwadi system, the ICDS. They are all supplying local, locally grown, locally produced, processed and marketed, well, ragi, foxtail millet, banyard millet, porso, I mean, all these, yeah? Now, if we can't take the, well, let's say, this local linkage, around in the same way to other, other states, we should ask what the problem is, right? If the other states are not already learning from this. The problem is actually the supply syndrome that the union government has institutionalized, right? There is a massive, who gains from the lax crores of fertilizer subsidy? Who gains from the lax crores of irrigation subsidies? Irrigation, not as canal irrigation. The last canal irrigation engineers have almost retired now. Nobody has been re-employed there. What you have now is what we call um, irrigation equipment suppliers. Yeah? So irrigation equipment, water saving in the name of, well, let's say water saving technologies, there is a lot of centralized, subsidized equipment supply. So when we talk about, well, the lessons that we can learn from, the, from this, well, let's say redesigning the program guidelines, creating a new millet mission, yeah? Um, there's this big question of should it be in a mission mode like and also ran along with mainstream agriculture? Because of course, I mean, you know that Sambalpur and these major, well, let's say in Orissa, the, the rice producing tracts are still, I mean, guzzling the largest amount of fertilizer use per hectare in the country, right? So we're talking about systems that have not completely shifted to sustainable agriculture or, well, the state itself has not changed its entire policy towards sustainable millets production or any crop production. So how do we then take these lessons from the millet mission within the state and to other states? Given that this is, this is well, let's say a difficult question because not everybody is going to change suddenly, especially given the vested interests with the supply syndrome, that is there are certain sectors of the economy that are completely dependent on the massive union government subsidies, right? For chemicals and fertilizers, for, for pesticides, for, um, for fuel, yeah? All these subsidies. Now, they are not going to move off easily. Also, the corporate interests in processing and marketing and also input supply, right? I mean, they're not going to move off easily. But these alternatives, once institutionalized in the, well, within the population, it's very difficult to change them. Because once people get used to the idea of, well, this is the way we want to produce, process and consume. Yeah, this is good for our health, this is good for our soils, this is good for our water, this is good for our local work, rural employment, decent work for women, local populations, what more do you want, right? So it may not, well, let's say add GDP, like the way we talk about GDP growth, right? But it is definitely showing prosperity at the local level. That's not going to go off easily, especially as we've learned from the Kerala experiment with decentralization. You know, when, when Thomas Isaac gave 40% devolution to the, to the local government, people were saying, oh, it's going to be corrupt and it's going to go down the drain. But a few of them did it right the first time, several of them did it right the second time, and from then on, things have been very difficult to change. That that devolution of financial capacity made a big difference to the local government. It's a similar institutionalization and enculturation of this deliberative democratic engagement of knowledge and policy that we will see once this well, lessons of this become visible to the world. Yeah? Enculturation is already happening, but the lessons of this have to be make, made visible to our world, especially to our union government policy makers and, um, and the state governments, other state governments, um, including Orissa government, of course. But why are we talking about the union government again and again? Let's face it, if it were not for one small innovation, perhaps the only innovation that our planning system has done in the past, well, about 50 years, yeah, is the RKVY. The Rashtriya Krishi Vikas Yojana, which gave 
like I said, Arun Ghosh's critique, right, in the late 1980s, that centralization has killed four sectors. Centrally, sub, centrally sponsored and centrally designed schemes, CSS, were the mainstay of agriculture. 100% centralized schemes in, an, in a country with an explosive diversity of agriculture and food, right? That was a big mistake. What did the RKVY do? It gave 25% of the, of the central allocation to the state governments to say, you do what you want to do for your state. Of course, I mean, Rajasthan government gave that 25% RKVY allocation to Monsanto and said, you give us hybrid maize. Yeah? Maharashtra government did something very interesting. They said, we will implement an integrated best management program yeah? for four major crops in 28 districts. And it was wonderful because they learned that they didn't know very much about the local pests. They had to call the NCIPM for help, the National Center for Integrated Pest Management for, for help. Um, Dr. Vendila here in IARI in Delhi did a wonderful piece of work working with them to train local scouts, local scout managers. What are we talking about here? We're talking about decentralized experiments, whether it is pest management or millets or whatever, where state governments have already got lessons. They already have lessons where, well, if you can just draw up these guidelines, Seeing farmers not just as producers, farm households as knowledgeable actors invested in knowledge, technology, and also local employment generation, right? If we see them as something beyond just, well, primary producers, then we will have a completely different worldview of agriculture and we don't have to buy into these, well, theories of labor productivity and convergence of labor productivity, the Lewisian model or the Schultzian definition of human capital. We can have our own, well, what I mean our own as in not Indocentric or Sinocentric as opposed to Eurocentric or anything. I'm just talking about the ways in which a substantive, well, diverse but democratically based knowledge system and production system where farmers are not subject to these well theories by well academics especially academics from the west or those of us who are trained in, in that kind of literature right they can actually create their own knowledge and policy systems all they need is a little support a little patience and hearing from their local state governments and local civil society support local actors who can actually scale up and enable this one it is very important to have the union government to make these like the RKVY example in the 11th plan. That was a big innovation, a big boost. Like it, as Shubita would say, takes you to a completely different punctuated equilibrium, right? It shifts you. That's what the RKVY does. It gave the state, states the capacity to do something different, gave them the money, put the money where your mouth is. And that is what these governments have built on where the changes that, have, that are visible to us 2016 onwards, now Krishna Chaudhary Center for Development Studies, Vasan, I mean, several actors, Pradhan and MSSRF, and so many different actors who've worked with the local governments in, the, in this case. Why are we again talking about our difficulty to, to learn from these policy experiments? Yeah? We have to think about this and talk about this as, as well, third world agriculture, what Hobsbawm calls the last bastion of the present tree, right? Um, we are still holding out, thankfully, against the new fundamentals of growth that have been imposed on us since the 1950s. Truman's, we will bring you prosperity, we will bring you, you know, income growth. There'll be a little pain, but you have to adjust to it, right? 1949. We've all been tutored in that. Here's an example, here's a great lesson that we can learn. Fundamental transformations, people keep well, accusing me of talking about, oh, such fundamental changes, you know, you're just dreaming. But here's a dream that, that's actually working in the field, yeah? We want to tinker with the central, well, CACP, you know, category A, B kind of prices. These are small incremental changes. Here's a fundamental change that is happening right under our very noses in our state governments, within our state governments, within our polity, within our civil society. We have to learn from these. So one, we are still, Indian agriculture is still holding out against the new fundamentals of growth that have been imposed on us. Two, that there is, well, scope for macroeconomic and political reordering of giving primacy to human beings, not as labor and, you know, with all due respect, not just a labor theory of value, but as a democratic citizen, our right to work yeah? It's not just a right that we're pulling out of the blue because we are part of a production function, right? But as a right as a dignified citizen to work, to contribute to technological and institutional learning, 
Yeah? Institution learning in particular, our local context, our, well, our engagement with global agriculture and capital flows, it's all linked. We can actually work towards better growth technology, that's work technology agriculture linkages. Again, when we say work, it's not just fossil fuels and energy of that sort, but human beings and embodied energy in us, in our ability to understand our ecosystems, to understand the damage that we do to our ecosystems, whether it's groundwater or soil or biodiversity. We know that. Yeah? You talk to any farmer, and um, there is this lady called Tuljama in Telangana, who I call Tuljama Georges Kirojan. I mean, she's so knowledgeable about material and energy flows, about social metabolism of her system. She doesn't call it social metabolism because that's not the language that she uses. But here again, the scope for the vernacular engagement of, well, democratic deliberative engagement through the vernacular at the local level. There are so many lessons here. I'm going to stop here and just hope and pray that we take this forward. As a learning engagement, we can do things differently in Punjab right now. Yeah. Punjab is a different story because, well, um, like I say, it's been, uh, well, in some sense, a colony of the Union government for ages now. It has to change. We have to find ways of changing it for Punjab government, for Punjab's farmers and civil society to stand up for themselves and do things differently. Yeah? And we can do that. We can make the difference. It's just that we have to find ways of, as some of our very early debates on agricultural knowledge policy relationships say we have to find ways of engaging with our nature that is ecosystems first and farming in the environment not versus the environment farming using local understandings of these environments and consumption patterns yeah we can do that we've lessons with us now so I'm just going to hope and pray that we learn, that we invest in our learning abilities and make the necessary changes. Um, and thank you very much.